Thank you. Thanks, Gina. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Wallman. I'm one of the uh, moderators for today's session along with my um, partner here, Rhonda Huseman. Welcome to the ACRL IS Management and Leadership Committee's online discussion series. Today's topic is fostering curiosity, invigorating your library's teaching and learning culture in SOTL. We'll start with um, brief introductions for both the moderators and the presenters. That'll be followed by a presentation and we'll end the session with a Q&A. As Gina mentioned, please do use that chat box to note any technical issues that might come up during today's session, as well as any questions for the Q&A. Uh, Rhonda and I will be mo uh, monitoring that chat box for any questions, so we'll try to keep track of all of them. And with that, we'll do a quick introduction. Um, I've kind of already introduced myself. I'm Lauren. I'm at the University of Cincinnati Blue Ash College, and I'm a member of the uh, Management and Leadership Committee. Along with me is my co-moderator, Rhonda Huseman from St. Cloud State University. She is also a member of the Management and Leadership Committee. Our presenters today, hopefully you see their video up so you can see them and they're currently waving. So we have Lauren Hayes. She's the instructional and research librarian at Maybe Library at Mid-America Nazarene University. We also have Melissa Mallon, Director of Peabody Library and Director of Teaching and Learning at Vanderbilt University. And then we also have Margie McMillan, Senior Researcher at Project Information Literacy. So with that, hopefully everybody can hear us loud and clear. Um, you should hopefully be seeing the shared screen with the presentation intro slide up on the screen for you. And with that, I'll turn it over to our three presenters. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, we are very excited to be here with you all today. And we're actually representing um, sort of an international contingent at the moment. So Lauren is our, our sole US um, panelist and Margie's up in Canada. And then I'm on vacation in England. So uh, hope, fingers crossed my hotel Wi-Fi does not cut out on us. Um, but my fellow panelists are ready to jump in just in case. Um, so just to kind of follow up on that introduction, um, that wonderful introduction from Lauren, we are very thankful that Rhonda and Lauren have invited us to present today um, on this topic. The three of us, and I would say not that we would pick a ringleader necessarily, but um, Margie is probably our ringleader. She's been involved in SOTL for quite some time. Um, and has, I think inspired and um, not to to use the word invigorate everywhere I go, but I think she's really invigorated um, our interest in SOTL. And so at, later um, on in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about some of the current projects that we're working on and some of the other um, exciting SOTL things to come. But um, today we wanted to talk a little bit more about how um, you can use the scholarship of teaching and learning from more of a leadership perspective, which is something that, um, I personally don't see a lot of discussion about um, in the literature. I think that it's often rightly so focused on student learning, which is great and important and a very big part of what SOTL is. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about how it can be used to influence an instruction program um, from more of a kind of bigger picture leadership scale. So um, we're going to start out by just giving you a little bit of an overview of what SOTL is. Um, hopefully you're a little bit familiar. Um, with the idea of scholarship and teaching and learning, but we wanted to do a quick refresh and then we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a leadership context and then um, move on to how that can be used to inform and enhance your teaching and learning culture. Um, Lauren and Margie, did I miss anything with that little intro? No? No. Nope. Okay. Great. All right, perfect. So um, this is a little, uh, just kind of a refresh about what SOTL is. And uh, at the end of our slides, we do have a bibliography if you want to learn a little bit more, if you want to read a little more. Um, there's always opportunities for uh, expanding your knowledge base about SOTL. And I, I'm not sure if we've shared the slides yet, but we absolutely will um, once we're finished today. So uh, essentially, SOTL as a um, 
as a practice is a systematic literature-based study of processes and outcomes um, involved in teaching and learning, which is intended for, and I think this is one of the important pieces, it's intended for peer-reviewed publication and dissemination. So um, the idea that you're not only asking questions and exploring your own teaching and your students' learning, but you're also sharing that with your colleagues, which um, personally, this is what SOTOL has been um, very much a thing for me is that we have all shared a lot with each other. Um, we share ideas, we share um, innovations, we share questions, um, and you will hear from several of us that we are very much focused on the positive and not so much the challenge. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that, what that means if, uh, if you are a leader. Um, in teaching and learning and, and how you can apply that to your work. Um, but SOTL is essentially evidence-based, so it's a way to um, focus on student learning. It's grounded in context. Um, as Felton says, it's methodologically sound, conducted in partnership with students, and then again, publicly disseminated. Um, so I think one of the other great things about SOTL is it is very inclusive and it does have the potential to really impact the classroom and to help you as an educator contribute to the, both the production of knowledge and the ongoing improvement in teaching and learning. Um, so what does that mean from a leadership perspective? SOTL, um, again, is often used to answer questions about student learning, but um, we're focusing today on how it can be used also by directors and coordinators of teaching and learning programs to inform your practice as a manager. So um, let me just take a pause and say, even if you're not a coordinator or director of a teaching and learning program, use this hour um, to reflect on sort of your big picture ideas of SOTL as it relates to your instruction program. And think about some of the enduring questions and issues that surround um, the teaching and learning program in your library. And this can be focused just internally on your own library. It can also be focused externally um, on your campus teaching and learning culture, um, or even just within, you know, if you're a department of one, how do you approach your teaching? Um, what kind of leadership and sort of big picture questions are you bringing uh, to your program? So uh, another way that you can think about this is what are some of the student learning patterns that may be occurring in your um, instruction? And again, that can be just you personally, it can be your colleagues. Um, this can also be a really good way to tie in to assessment at the programmatic level. So thinking about some of those bigger questions, those bigger information literacy concepts that you're wanting to try to focus on. Um, also, instruction coordinators can use SOTL as a foundation for a lot of different things, um, for helping your librarian colleagues reflect on their identity as teaching librarians. Um, SOTL is, because it is so focused on asking questions and digging deep, it is a really good way to help people think about what they do and why they do it, and then how that impacts the students that they work with. And it can also be a way to help uh, librarians build their pedagogical skills as well, because it's asking them to really look at the learning process and think about perhaps some of the, the theories or ideas that that underlie what's going on in the classroom. Um, it, instruction coordinators can also use SOTL to create a culture of innovation and again with the question asking um, it's I think especially if you are in a position of leading an instruction program going to your librarian colleagues and saying you know why are you doing this this way? What did the students get out of it? How did your last class go? Asking those questions, thinking about ways to kind of change things up. And we'll talk about, uh, I think Margie's going to talk about Randy Bass again in just a little bit. Um, but he is very big on this idea of the messy problem of teaching. So teaching is messy. Um, it's kind of complicated. It doesn't always go the way that we plan it to. I'd say mostly it doesn't go the way we plan it to. Um, so using that as sort of a, a launch pad for fostering curiosity and excitement within the librarians in your teaching and learning program. Um, again, thinking about issues or questions or just learning um, puzzles, I guess, as potential research or things to kind of delve into rather than this is a problem and I need to fix it. 
Um, if, it, if it feels like a problem, embrace that and start kind of encouraging those questions about why and how. Um, so that sort of leads into this idea of the teaching culture. Um, hopefully the teaching culture in your library is um, already sort of leaning towards that kind of um, excitement and curiosity and just wanting to, to dig deep and embrace the messiness. But as a leader, it's probably a good uh, sort of pause moment for you to start defining what the teaching culture is before you you can start determining how SOTO will best help you change that culture. So um, just looking at some of the, you know, what's good about the culture, what's bad. Um, on the, the more positive side of things, encouraging risk, um, risk and question asking, making sure that you're promoting ownership of teaching, I, both identity with individual librarians, but also just that classroom expertise. So in our collaborations with um, faculty and instructors that we're really embracing that. Um, on the maybe, uh, I don't like bad, so I'm gonna say the side that needs loosened up a little bit more. Um, if the culture is too prescriptive, if the librarians feel like they're kind of forced into a box, that's not going to be very conducive for encouraging SOTL experiments. Um, if the instruction environment is not necessarily focused on student learning, and then um, if the, those partnerships, collaborations with faculty and other librarians aren't there, um, I think one of my goals is to try to ha use SOTL as a catalyst for collaboration and partnerships um, rather than just feeling like it's this isolated experiment that I have to, to work on on my own. So there's just some ways to kind of start defining your, your teaching culture and then just again thinking about the boundaries um, of the culture within your library, within the, the the campus in your department. And then as a leader, start thinking about how you might describe your teaching culture to your colleagues, to your administrators, um, to those outside of the library, to all of us here. If you wanna throw it in the chat box, that would be great um, to start kind of thinking about what your culture is. And then we do have a few resources to help you start defining and examining what that teaching culture may look like. Um, and so one of those is the quality of teaching culture. This is a, a multi-institutional Canadian study from 2014. Again, the results of these are, are or sorry, the, um, the citations for these are in our slides at the end. Um, but this is one just possibility to, to creating a kind of a guide or framework for examining your teaching culture. Um, this particular study talked about understanding an institutional's cultural strengths and weaknesses, which helps establish the overall quality of the institution, the teaching culture within, and can help enable uh, quality enhancement of that culture. And so these indicators here are just asking you to look at several different things, um, such as the resources, the outcomes, uh, outputs, or measurable results. Um, the way the instruction is delivered and then um, the quality of the program as it relates to various stakeholders. It's just some questions. We're not really going to focus too much on this, um, but just to help you kind of get a sense there. And then another um, resource that you may want to take a look at is this survey um, from Brock University, which examines the perception of the teaching of teaching culture in these areas here. So um, a lot of this stuff I've already touched on in the last couple of minutes, but um, approaches to teaching the infrastructure, I think that's really important as a leader to think about um, what the kind of boundaries again are of your, of your um, instruction program and then the culture within your library. Um, and then, yeah, just start thinking, um, kind of defining to yourself, maybe have the conversation with your colleagues. Um, is your culture innovative? Is it more traditional? Are you just, do you have no idea? Are you still waiting to find out? Um, but setting some of these uh, sort of ground posts will help you start thinking about using SOTL um, for invigorating your teaching culture. Bing. So it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah, turn it over to Mark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have to do anything else to make myself appear in the window because I'm still seeing you, Melissa. So if anybody knows, let me know. Um, oh, good. Everybody else can see me. I exist. 
very reassuring. So I'm going to move into some of the nuts and bolts of how to use SOTL. And uh, first, I want to thank Melissa for that blush-inducing introduction. Um, I, I'm more of a Eminon Screes, I think, but behind the people who are doing the hard and heavy lifting of, of SOTL and librarianship right now, and I'm, I'm becoming more of a cheerleader than anything else. So I, I want to bring this back to the title of our presentation, which is Fostering Curiosity, because I think that's really the goal here, and, it, and it's a sense of curiosity. Somebody in the comments said that um, it's difficult to think of this with so much negative news about higher education around and retrenchment. But I think if we can bring it back to that curiosity and the why that we do it, that uh, has helped me get through dark times of retrenchment in, in the Canadian higher education sector. So think about what we can do to foster curiosity. And that's where Randy Bass is a touchstone for me. Um, his article is in the, uh, the citations at the end. Wouldn't be a librarian presentation without a long list of references. So worry not, they're there. Um, but Randy Bass talked about how we construct research problems as a good thing, as something to investigate, but teaching problems as a bad thing, as something to hide, to uh, not acknowledge, and certainly not as uh, fodder for scholarly inquiry. And he, he poked and prodded a little bit about why that is. And I, again, we tend to focus on subtle questions around what's not working in some of the reading that we do. But you can also investigate why is this working so well? Um, because then it makes it easier to, uh, to replicate. So I'm gonna take you through four stages of uh, practical advice for infusing SOTL to foster curiosity. And the first one is reading SOTL. Um, read SOTL, but don't just read library SOTL. Uh, I've said it before, read outside your species. Um, there's a lot of really good material out there, and there is an increasing amount, uh, much of our favorite references are, are in the slides at the end, an increasing amount of SOTL for leaders, of how do you develop um, a SOTL-infused culture? What can you do as a leader to support culture? And I want to uh, particularly flag um, material by Pat Hutchings and uh, Mary Sorsinelli in a forthcoming ACRL book. Uh, building a culture of teaching and learning because they get right into the nitty-gritty of rewards recognition supports um, And that's coming soon this summer from ACRL So look for that kind of information Build that social culture find out figure out what fits what might fit with your culture and why why would that fit? Why would something else not fit poke and prod a little bit at the readings? Um, we often say that would never work here I heard that a lot when I was working, and oddly enough, when you push that and you challenge it, turns out uh, it, it can work. And so you can read SOTL as a leader and, and look for those, those supports and patterns. What you can also do is the co-reading aspect. Um, at Mount Royal University, there's now a very successful SOTL journal club meeting monthly, talking about articles. And what's that, what that's done across the university is help build a shared language um, and a shared language not just to talk about SOTL but a shared language to talk about teaching and that language and culture are kind of fundamentally linked and so if you can work to build that shared culture uh, on the basis of shared language it may um, help to solidify uh, SOTL going from individuals working in their own classrooms to something more programmatic and uh, and deliberate. So sharing language and curiosity. I would say that if you're going to do co-reading around SOTL, it would probably be useful to pick something, again, not in the library context. Um, the further from the library context you can get for an example of SOTL research that might still be germane, the less likely people are going to dismiss it or adopt it without criticism. <laughs> Right? If you pick something that's about group work in biology dissection labs, that doesn't sound very much like library instruction or, or information literacy instruction, but you'll see that there are patterns and ways of looking at questions and ways of, of studying questions and ways of gathering evidence that might be applicable to the library situation. And, and there's less um, not me or me too-ing. Uh, if you choose an example that's further away from, from library science. 
So consider streams. There are a number of streams in SOTL that are common with information literacy. A lot of conversations around undergraduate research uh, that we're seeing in the SOTL literature. A lot of work on fostering, um, fostering research attitudes in students. Uh, by people who may not have read the ACRL framework and have it tattooed on their body somewhere um, and who are actually working outside of libraries. Uh, there are also streams in SOTL that I think librarians could pay attention to with, with some benefit. And I would say chief among those are the students as partners. This has really taken off. This is involving students right from the get-go from generating the research question. Um, and it's really interesting to see what some of those partnerships are coming up with from the students' perspective, what they would like to know about teaching and learning, because it's often quite different from those of us on the other side. Um, the other thing that I, I, I would stress, and, and Lauren is going to talk about this further on in the presentation, is the emphasis in SOTL on what is questions. Um, so in, in information literacy, literature, I tend to see a lot of what works um, questions and proving whether X or Y intervention did or did not work. Um, what I, I see in the SOTL that I find most compelling is the what is. Let, let's understand what is going on with the students when we do something a certain way or when they are doing, even more to the point, something a certain way. So there's a lot of reading out there to be done. Um, reading on the leadership end and then enabling co-reading to build culture and language uh, among uh, librarians and certainly across campus. Um, mix the groups up. Uh, have mixed groups around SOTL and if there isn't one on campus already, the library is a great host for that sort of thing. Number one, the links will work and all the copyright will be handled correctly. So I can see the next slide. So after you've done all this reading, or while you're doing all this reading, um, you can move from reading to doing. Uh, and one of the things that I don't see an awful lot of in the SOTL work is replicating. SOTL is extraordinarily context dependent. Um, Schumann and others talk about you really need to describe um, a thick and rich description of context in your writing, and that's something that is a reviewer in SOTL that I watch for. And you actually really need to um, understand what context the teaching and learning that you're studying is going on in. But that doesn't mean that you can't try replicating it in other contexts. It may not work the same way. Oh dear. Uh, it may work beautifully, and it may not. Um, work uh, at all. But SOTL isn't about necessarily success or failure. It's about understanding. And so if replicating a SOTL study provides completely different results, that's a really rich and deep area for study. Um, and, and again, poking and prodding at the why. Um, and again, on the leadership side, there's a lot of research and writing around the initiation of various SOTL in, uh, institutional initiatives, SOTL programs, SOTL support programs. And again, lots of ideas for you to try, lots of ideas that come complete with um, research protocols so that you can study the effects of, of these innovations and these initiatives. Um, and then there's new research. There is a ton of room for new research. Uh, particularly in information literacy, there's a growing body, and I'm loving seeing it happen, of SOTL in the information literacy context, but there is a, there's a wealth of the kind of research that sometimes we're the ones best situated in the institution to do. Um, Nancy Chick, for, inter for instance, we've had great conversations about what's going on in the reference one-to-one -one interaction online, in person, on the phone. What kind of learning is happening there? And, and what does that mean? Because that's a stage of student learning that not a lot of people have access to, necessarily. And, and so there are productive opportunities that really librarians can do um, better than anyone else. And I want to finish off my section with a, a kind of why is this important? Well, 
a thesis recently published by Lauren Hayes, who's going to be speaking next, um, looked into academic librarians' teacher identity development through the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, and how that can influence, how that can benefit um, in instruction librarians in so many different ways. And so I would urge you to have a look at that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, Margie. And because I know none of you actually want to read my dissertation, um, <laughs> I will say uh, just briefly that uh, the first article from my dissertation on academic uh, instruction librarians teacher identity through the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, is going to be published, I guess, this month. It is May now um, in the International Journal of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and that's an open access journal. Uh, so if anybody's interested in it, it's a completely probably um, not very humble of me to say that, uh, that it's coming out this month. So I apologize for that. But I also know you do not want to read my dissertation. I don't really want to read it again. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, thank you, Margie, again for that introduction. Uh, so I am going to talk about moving from individual to social social today. Um, and so when you think about moving from individual to social so social, or to put another way from individual work to work that has maybe a greater influence on a library's culture, um, you may want to use the framework of uh, micro, miso, macro, and mega. And this framework is discussed pretty extensively in the SOTO literature. I've seen a lot more about it come out in the last few years. Um, and it can help frame a lot of discussions about the breadth of SOTO that can occur on your campus. So let's just briefly walk through what each of these is. Um, and uh, I will then talk about some examples. So micro represents activities of faculty members and students um, at the meso or miso level represents kind of middle management, such as department chairs, uh, whose role is to interpret and act as conduits of information between and across different levels uh, at the university. Um, the macro is more where senior management kind of sets the strategic direction of the university. And then at the mega level, that's really SOTL that's conducted within disciplinary communities or national contexts. Um, so, of course, all of these contexts influence each other, um, even if you are only focusing on one. Using this framework to invigorate your library's teaching and learning culture can look a few different ways. Uh, and one way is to encourage and support a focus on the micro level of librarians working with students in one shots or at the reference desk uh, or in a semester long class. At the micro level, librarians can ask questions about their teaching and their students learning. Uh, and total questions librarians could ask include Pat Hutchings. Margie already mentioned Pat Hutchings uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, but she has a taxonomy of questions from her book that was published in 2000 titled Opening Lines. Um, I'm going to kind of just talk through each one of those because I really think it helps it to um, understand what that micro level could look like. Um, and then I have a few examples here that I will say uh, come from Elon University's Center for Engaged Learning. If you really want to get more into SOTL, um, I have to kind of give a plug for Elon University Center for Engaged Learning. They have some great videos out there that really go deeply um, about uh, what just SOTL is and ways to think about SOTL. Okay, so first though, again, at the micro level, um, We've got those what works questions. And so these questions could be uh, inquiry into the effectiveness of teaching practices and pedagogical approaches. So some examples include, you might want to ask, do students learn more when they have to teach the content to, to their peers um, than if they don't have to teach that content to their peers? Another question you could ask is, do students demonstrate more mastery of content in a flipped classroom versus a non-flipped classroom? Then there are those what is questions, and Margie mentioned these earlier, but these are really descriptive inquiries about students learning. So what is happening? That's really, you know, what you're asking with that one. And examples include um, what prior knowledge do my students bring to this first year course? Um, or what characteristics do literature cl classes require students to read outside of class in preparation for classroom discussions? Um, so again, just what is happening. 
Then the other, uh, the third question that uh, Pat Hutchings describes in her book are visions of the possible. And these are inquiry focused on what might be, what could be happening in this classroom. Uh, so for example, what would happen if I used a reacting to the past game to help students understand the social political context of ancient Greece? Um, or um, how might a systematic reflection activity completed when I return work prompt students to apply feedback? Uh, and then finally, formulating new conceptual frameworks. These are models and frameworks that lead to new inquiry questions. Um, so examples include what themes emerge from students on reflection that might help um, us understand, understand students' development of kind of the metacognitive awareness. Uh, and then another example is what might systematic analysis of student bottlenecks tell us about troublesome knowledge in the discipline? Uh, and that I think really ties in a lot to the framework. Uh, so we could look at those kind of conceptual framework questions when we're looking at the ACRL IL framework. So again, all of those questions can be asked at more of that micro level. Um, there's a lot of good work that can be done at the micro level. And as Margie said, I think it can really um, generate and foster a lot of creativity um, within the teaching and learning culture when that information is shared publicly. Let's Next, let's look at the departmental level or that meso level, because um, library leaders can encourage SOTL through activities which support and cultivate connections within and across the different departments, such as collaborative projects and grants. Um, support the inquiry of teaching and learning at the department level and seek to understand how the library as a department is impacting student learning. Um, so at the macro level, library leaders can invigorate teaching and learning by encouraging additional collaborative projects aligned with institutional priorities. Um, so additionally, if SOTL is not a large part of your institutional culture, the library could actually take a lead in SOTL advocacy by leading faculty learning communities, uh, showcasing their own micro level work and hosting journal clubs. Um, and this type of macro level social work demonstrates to other campus departments and stakeholders the library's role in teaching and learning. And then at the mega level, library leaders can encourage their staff to participate in broad teaching and learning conversations. Uh, engage in international writing groups. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I am going to one day when I find a little bit more time in my life. <laughs> uh, also study information literacy learning outside the bounds of a particular institution. Um, we can further transfer student collaboration between two and four year college collaborations to support information literacy. I've seen some good work there um, between collaborations across institutions looking at uh, transfer students from two year colleges into four year and what information they can learn about that. Uh, at each level, reflection can be used to invigorate teaching cultures. Spending time reflecting on what worked, what didn't work, what needs to be changed, and what you would like to see happen in the future, I think can really lead to a lot of excitement uh, and a lot of growth uh, in your own teaching and learning culture at your institution. You might be thinking that your library already does some of these things, but doesn't necessarily call it SOTL yet. Um, and that's likely true. You probably are doing some of these things. I think a lot of what librarians do is SOTL work um, without the SOTL title. Or, and this is where uh, we're hoping to help make the connection, or the connection to the SOTL community. Um, one strong reason SOTL is so useful in invigorating teaching and learning cultures is because there are a lot of other people in different disciplines asking very similar questions about their own teaching and their own students' learning. So that example I gave of like flipped learning earlier, that's a question that works across all disciplines and a, a lot of educators could be asking about their classes. So realizing there's a community of like-minded instructors um, can be really refreshing. I know it has for me personally um, in my own teaching and learning. SOTL also gives a core to build from without being prescriptive uh, by emphasizing shared values and a shared culture, um, but also being very grounded in the context of the institution um, and the teaching and learning. We know things that work for some group of students uh, might not work for other groups of students. Again, just because of the context, uh, background, uh, knowledge of the students, uh, etc. 
So using SOTL to support pedagogical innovation. Um, as Melissa said earlier, when talking about teaching cultures, um, you often want to start with the prioritization and support of teaching, the assessment, looking at different approaches to teaching, thinking about your infrastructure, um, talking about engagement around teaching at your institution, and then also recognizing teaching. And so understanding where you need to focus your time can help you decide if you need to start at the micro, meso, macro, or mega levels. You should ask yourself if your librarians are excited about teaching, um, but maybe frustrated by the lack of campus connection, or campus understanding, there we go, about their role. If that is the case, you might want to think about starting more at the macro level. Um, or if you discover your librarians are burnt out on teaching, then a focus on the micro level um, is likely a good place to start and really start thinking about what's happening in the classroom, why are things working, why are things not working. Uh, and once you decide where to start, it's time to start thinking practically about what that means. Uh, so the first thing I encourage you to do is to help your librarians make connections. These connections can be within your library or outside of the library on your campus. Uh, or with other librarians or SOTLers at other institutions. Uh, the ability to make teaching and learning public and share knowledge is really a hallmark of what SOTL is, um, because too often teaching is seen as a solo act uh, when much can actually be learned from making teaching community property. And I'm completely stealing that phrase from a book um, on SOTL and teaching as community property. It's a great book. <laughs> uh, so as you think about connections, specifically think about the challenges or opportunities that exist within your teaching culture uh, and make connections that will strengthen and bolster those areas. Be creative. I'm going to say I'm the first to admit that I um, do not have a lot of creativity. It's not my strongest skill. Um, so I've learned to compensate uh, by gathering ideas from others and getting a lot of diverse perspectives and opinions about how to change my own teaching practices. Um, these different voices that speak into my teaching have allowed me to maximize my very limited creativity. Um, and since at the core of SOTL is the public sharing of teaching and learning, capturing creative strategies from others, I think can truly invigorate um, a teaching and learning culture that can just sometimes feel tired. I know for me, I've been there before. So with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Margie. So um, I'm just going to briefly run over a few of these tremendous SOTL opportunities coming up um, and, uh, and just say how excited I am to see such a, a wide variety and a rich support for SOTL in libraries. So um, there are ALA workshops starring our very own Lauren and Melissa coming up, yes, and uh, a book edited by Lauren, Melissa, Carrie, Bradley and others, uh, and jump in to correct me if you like. Um, on the Grounded Instruction Librarian, you might recall that in the Librarian Sotal space, we asked for participants a little while back, it seems. Uh, time has flown, and the book is coming out in summer 2019, and I couldn't be more excited. There are webinars. Um, keep posted on the ACRL site, webinars, and if you do all four, you get the book. A bonus. Um, and then there's Library Juice Academy, led again by Lauren Hayes, um, which is an in-depth, uh, really good introduction to the scholarship of teaching and learning that will build capacity for you and for anybody in the libraries that you work with. Uh, I want to put in a plug for the ISOTL conference. It's easy to get to this year. It's in Atlanta, uh, October 9th to 12th, so it won't be quite as hot as a summer conference there might be. Um, and ISOTL is the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. As a librarian, I found it incredibly welcoming, and I think others have too. There is now an information literacy interest group within ISOTL that will be meeting, I am sure, um, at the ISOTL conference. Uh, so have a look at that uh, as a possible way of extending your SOTL work. We're going to go into questions soon. Um, there are resources in the slides that follow the any questions slide uh, and uh, a prompt to keep sharing at the librarian SOTL hashtag. 
Um, and we also include some Twitter feeds to follow that tend to have uh, high quality uh, SOTL and librarian SOTL content. Anything well, else? we open it up for questions here. I'll go ahead and just kind of flip through the other slides yeah. so that everybody, if they want to kind of capture some of the resources that we've been mentioning, um, I'll leave those up for a few minutes each. Okay. But we're ready for questions now? Yeah. Have at her. Um, one thing that this came back a long time ago, clear back when I was talking um, from Pete, who made a comment, it wasn't really a question, but he made a comment that I want to address because I feel like probably a lot of people are thinking this, um, which was that it can be very hard to determine your teaching culture in a hunker down mode um, because of the lack of budget and maybe resources that are um, provided for your teaching, uh, whether that be an entire instruction program or whatever that look, even if it's just a couple of you, whatever that looks like. Um, oh, Pete says half the number of librarians is four, year, four years ago, which I, I mean, I think that this is probably one of the most realistic struggles in barriers to doing this kind of work is that sometimes you just have to put your head down and do your job, right? Like that's all you can do. Um, all I can say is that I have been where you are, Pete, and the thing that has helped me keep going is being able to find that sort of little spark of curiosity and excitement that gets me, I don't know, I mean, I think that you're just doing your job, you're trying to teach your classes, you're meeting the demand, but if there's just that little bit that that even if you just jot down on a post it at the end of a class, you know, I've got this question or this thing was kind of weird. I wonder what's behind it. Um, a student said this comment and, I, and I'm not quite sure what that looks like um, are, you know, are my other two colleagues experiencing this thing, same thing. Um, I think that while you may not be able to devote yourself to a that kind of bigger scale sort of research endeavor that sometimes SOTL, um, especially if you're, you're wanting to disseminate your research, that doesn't mean that you can't still talk about these things um, with your colleagues, with, I don't know, when, with your partner, with your friends, or I've been known at a dinner party to start talking about student learning, and maybe that's not the best idea, but um, I think if you can just find that one little thing that, that gets you excited, maybe that will help you kind of keep going and and start to, to dig a little bit deeper and give you a bit of a break from kind of the demands of just the day-to-day. -day. Hey. So I see that Liz asked a question. Um, how much do you think staffing affects success with starting a teaching and learning culture from scratch? Um, Maybe I want to clarify just a, a little bit. Um, is it about hiring practices or um, I guess maybe like what we're looking at with staffing. Melissa, I don't know if you want to take that question too, since I know you're the director where you are. Sure. So, I mean, it, I think to me, a teaching and learning culture can be just a single person. Um, it, it really is how you are thinking about you're teaching, whether it's just you, whether it's, um, you know, a, a staff of, of 20 liaison librarians, whatever that looks like. Um, I think that it definitely, again, just to kind of go to what we were saying earlier with Pete's comment, it can be really hard when you lose some of the people that have been doing the work. One thing that I've noticed though, when um, I have been down subject librarians and have to either myself teach an engineering class or work with colleagues that are teaching biology and it's it's not our area at all and we don't know what the heck we're doing. Um, sometimes those can actually be the most um, invigorating moments to be able to just try something completely different to learn from a new discipline um, to start asking those questions beyond just 
we're going to do this teaching in a very prescriptive way. Um, I think it starts, though, with having the conversation with your colleagues. And even if you are the only instruction librarian, you are your teaching and learning program, um, I think you can still do that. It sometimes takes going out to, Lauren was mentioning earlier about journal clubs or writing groups across campus to try to um, engage with someone outside of the library as well. Sometimes that can help just to have that support system. But um, I definitely think that you can still define your culture even if you only have a few of you. It just takes thinking about what you want to get out of um, your teaching and learning sort of experience and what you want your program to say. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answers the question. Um, I think so. Liz Clear, um, said that it was a staffing size. So yeah, Melissa, okay. I think you answered yeah. that very well. Okay. Thank you. So it looks like we had another question. How do I best incorporate SOTL into my work if I can't do actual research that I would then share? Uh, can I maybe take that? Yes, please. Hi. So this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, not everybody has the capacity or the support or indeed, sadly, at some libraries is allowed to do research. And I think you can incorporate SOTL first most easily by reading it um, and taking ideas that others have evidence for and, and applying it. To actually do SOTL on small scale, um, you can start looking at, if, if you wanted to do your own investigations, um, start with really small questions. Uh, try changing up, try asking the students to review um, a worksheet that you have or an activity that you have and, and get, get at the what is. Um, there's often less pressure to publish uh, what is things and what works. So if you're not publishing it, you could, yes, SOTL demands to some extent um, putting your work out there in a peer reviewed format, but that, that can also be on blogs. So if the problem is, that you don't want to put it out in traditional venues, there are non-traditional venues to post information from the subtle work that you're doing. If the difficulty is no support to actually do research projects of your own, then you can try incorporating subtle research and perhaps work with other faculty who may be doing subtle on your campus, um, sometimes subversively, uh, if there's no credit for it. Um, so there's there's ways to start it, but it sort of depends on where the block is uh, as to what might work best. Does that, I hope that helps. And I'll just add that uh, um, even if you're not able to do research, um, at least digging into the literature on SOTL um, can be a really useful place to start because it can, that can just generate ideas and new things that you might want to try. Um, we all have a lot of demands on our time and research certainly takes a lot of time. Um, so I know, I mean, honestly, the way that I most engage in SOTL is reading it. Um, you know, I, I enjoy research and hope to do more of it in the future, but reading is certainly the, where I spend the vast majority of my SOTL time. Um, I saw a couple of questions, I think, that are sort of semi-related, but would probably be helpful um, to address. One of which was working with teaching and learning centers who maybe um, may tend to own um, sort of teaching culture and that sort of thing. And then also talking with faculty about pedagogy without stepping on toes. And I know, Lauren, you've done a lot of work in this um sort of bridging that gap um but i think it might be helpful to if we talked a little bit about what that looks like yeah i'm happy to talk about teaching and learning centers and faculty development <laughs> that's a little bit of my other world um so <laughs> You know, cultures are always a tricky thing and every university has their own kind of unique culture around that um what i would definitely recommend is 
spend some time trying to understand, uh, you know, the teaching culture broadly, even outside of your library. Um, I always think it's best to go into conversations with more information than less information. Uh, and so if uh, you can really seek to understand that why the teaching and learning center might think that they own um, some of those conversations, I think it would be worthwhile. Um, and then also, though, going in and having a conversation about how you can be supportive and collaborative um, with work that they're already doing. I know um, there was a, an article that I think it came out of the in tw the 2015 um, ACRL um, conference proceedings about how librarians sometimes feel in um, kind of a competition. There we go. That's the word uh, with faculty development centers. Um, and I think in some ways that I, I would there's probably good reason for that, but I also think that sometimes we have to shift our mindset a little bit and think that there are ways that we can uh, collaborate with them. Um, everybody, you know, with, the, as we were talking about earlier, um, with funding concerns in higher education, everybody is trying to, you know, kind of maintain some footing. Um, and so I really think instead of thinking even about what you're doing is overlapping with something that a teaching and learning center or faculty development work is doing, think about the adjacencies. Um, think about where your work, you know, kind of uh, comes up closely to what they're doing and how you can even extend some of the work they're doing. And I think if you frame that conversation around extension, partnership, collaboration, um, that can really help it to kind of foster um, good working relationships with people. Um, you know, for me personally, um, with a reorg um, at our university, faculty development actually came under the same dean uh, as the library. And so uh, we've been able to kind of create some really good working relationships there. Um, but it's, there's also a structural um, kind of makeup that allows that to happen. I hope that answers that question. I would also point out, and I think Rhonda mentioned that she had something she wants to add to, um, but I just wanted to hearken back to what Margie said uh, about blogging and sharing your work in other ways beyond just peer-reviewed research articles, although that can be a very good way to sort of show that you're on the same footing as faculty. Um, but if it's not, if you're working to build that relationship with the Center for Teaching or you're wanting to highlight the work that your librarians are doing, having a blog, a newsletter. Um, we've done some sort of faculty showcase events at Vanderbilt that um, show some of the partnerships from our librarians and the faculty that they work with. So having those kind of things that, that gets your sort of get, gets you more exposure on campus can be one way to start sort of showing that, yes, we are doing this work. Yes, we are partners in this sort of thing. Um, we have a strong teaching culture within the library. Maybe we can collaborate and, and add more. Rhonda, did you have something you wanted to add in? I don't know if she's got audio anymore. Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, there she is. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to comment too. I used to work in the Center for Teaching and Learning and there was a lot of times where there was some downtime. Let's say when I would have an office space there and I was waiting for faculty to come in. They maybe needed help with the reading or they needed to put something online or and but there's something about collaborating with those folks that work in Center for Teaching and Learning on your own lesson planning. So if you're saying, hey, we've got a few minutes before the next person comes in, look, can, can we talk about developing this together? Um, our Center for Teaching and Learning did a lot of peer observation, um, which is also a nice um, way to include them um, and do some, um, you know, peer classroom observation kinds of things. Um, and obviously, not part of your work <laughs> and being judged in your faculty status or anything along those lines, but just kind of understanding their practice often then gets them, uh, gives them a light bulb and including you in theirs. So I think just really sharing and being collaborative that way. Um, and then word of mouth. So once you've got a really good interaction with the faculty member that comes in, maybe if you're the librarian that they call in to help or something along those lines, um, you know, it is definitely a team teaching effort. So just wanted to make that comment, but um, I don't need to add anything else to you fantastic panelists. So I, I will mute again. <laughs> um, Those are great ideas. 
I, I see a question there about the Sodal Journal Club, and if I can just talk about the one at Mount Royal, it was actually started by a biologist who was interested in Sodal, and they had used journal clubs in his disciplinary faculty to keep current on, on research in the field, uh, and he thought it would be a great idea for Sodal. Um, had used that a little bit under Nancy Chick at the University of Calgary, and then brought it to Mount Royal when he came over. And it's a cross-disciplinary, cross-campus group. Um, as Pete mentioned, I think food helps. So there were, there were snacks always uh, when I was attending. And very low stakes. Um, here's the article. This is what we're going to discuss. Come in and we'll talk about it. Uh, and so it was a really nice introduction, I think, for some people who were uh, new to SOTL and it was a nice opportunity for people working in SOTL to get out of that micro bubble and, and work and, and hear from people across the institution and, and librarians were just organically a part of that um, because they could come along too. It might have helped that it was hosted in one of the new library buildings, nice new meeting rooms. Maybe that, that might have been a useful thing. But Margie, I'm going to jump in because I heard you, you know, talk about that librarians were organically part of that. And so sometimes librarians just need to show up at teaching and learning conversations. Um, I think that's also part of what can really help um, others see us as teachers is just showing up and talking about teaching and learning. Let to faculty members hear what we do and hear what we think about. Um, I know we all think about teaching and learning a lot. So maybe we have time to address one more of the questions. I know we have a couple more we haven't been able to get to yet. Um, we had another question on, are there pedagogies that work particularly well with SOTL, active learning, informed learning, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning? Hmm. Um. I, I would say no, but I would uh, highlight in the bibliography the, the uh, resource by Janice Miller Young and Michelle Yeo um, about because that has useful connections between your teaching philosophy, your research methodologies, and the kind of teaching that you're looking at in, in terms of matching them up. So I think any kind of teaching and learning moment can be a subject of SOTL. Some may be easier to obtain evidence for without a psychic or an MRI machine, um, but, but I think any form of teaching and learning uh, can be a subject. Uh, anything that makes you go, hmm, about that sort of thing is fair game. I'll also add um, just kind of the questions about pedagogy. Um, there aren't really SOTL pedagogical methods per se, but there is a lot of literature on signature pedagogies um, in various disciplines. Uh, and so we've mentioned Nancy Chick a lot here. I know she was one of the editors on two books on signature pedagogies, and that is a phrase, uh, an idea that comes up a lot in the SOTL literature. So I would encourage you to maybe look at that idea because different disciplines certainly have different kind of core ways of teaching, uh, the different habits of mind um, that uh, they're trying to cultivate in their students. Uh, and so sometimes I think as librarians, we can perhaps go into a class and maybe do something that the students aren't as familiar with, um, which could be a really good thing, uh, but could also um, alternatively um, cause maybe a little bit of confusion on what's happening or how they need to approach the learning that day um, if they're being used to a very certain way of learning within a particular course. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. I don't know if that's really where you're going with that question, but I think it's an important point um, about the SOTL literature. All right, so I know we have a few more questions that we were not able to get to and unfortunately we are right at our time. Um, and so Rhonda and I will work with the presenters to get those other questions addressed if that sounds okay to you all. 
Um, let me think here. So I do want to give a, a huge thank you to our three presenters, Melissa, Lauren, and Margie. We really appreciate their time, their expertise, and sharing their experience with, with SODL. Um, thank you all to, also to ACRL uh, for providing the platform and to Gina for helping us with logistics. Thanks to Rhonda for being my co-moderator. Um, Rhonda, is there anything you'd like to add? No, just thank you every, everyone for your time and um, we hope that this sparks a lot of interest for the upcoming book and webinar series. And for those who are interested, we will have the recording available. We'll have it posted on all of the listservs as, lo as well as the IS website. And we hope to have that posted very soon. And, and Lauren, can we also share the link to our slides with that recording as well? Absolutely. We will include that as well. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you all so much for attending today and the great questions and comments that you've shared. Really great questions. Yes. Thank yeah. you.